Coming up on this week's show, Winamp is back again. Final fight comes to the Mega Drive. And we chat with Reflections founder, Martin Edmondson. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you every Friday with our wonderful friends at Bitmap Books. Now, one of their books you should absolutely check out if you love adventure games, their back big style at the moment, is their third edition of the Art of Point and Click Adventure Games, celebrating the very best pixel art and classic scenes from the games that define that genre. We'll tell you more about that in just a bit and check out the rest of their retro gaming books at bitmapbooks.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 338, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to this week's show, where every Friday we take you on a total nostalgia trip. So that's the aim of this podcast, not only to keep our gaming memories alive, but also to hear inside stories from the people and the companies who made the games that we grew up playing. And I think, you know, we cover all aspects of retro gaming on this show. Obviously, there's a lot of nostalgia in there, but there's so much happening in the retro gaming scene. It's not all about looking back 20, 30 years. We talk about, you know, collecting, new hardware add-ons for classic machines, the amount of new games that are made for retro consoles and retro computers each week. We can barely keep up with them all, can we? It's such a vibrant industry right now. Totally, and like... I, I, th- I think nostalgia is good, but also a bit of history because we talk about nostalgia. Sometimes you can have these like rose tinted glasses on when people talk about the past and like with history, getting somebody on who, who we interview, you know, they actually tell us what happened in the day. And it's good to have mm. like from the horse's mouth because sometimes our memories like deceive us a bit <laughs> like what happened, you know, and each person has a different perspective on it. And I think that's really important and also, you're totally right. Like the news section, there's so much stuff coming out in the world of retro. It's just absolutely mental. And, you know, when we first started this, we thought, hmm, there's not going to be that much news going on, is there? There's not going to be that much happening. But my God, definitely a lot of stuff happening at the moment. Yeah, the retro scene just keeps getting bigger and bigger, I think. But I think you made a good point there as well about, um, you know, why we do the interviews on this podcast too. Because I remember, you know, back in the pre internet era, You'd often read like rumours in magazines or even like playground rumours at school. And you always wondered like, is that really true? So it's amazing to actually get the people on who were behind the companies and the games that we played back in the day. So this week, we've got an absolute legend who is going to be joining us in the second half of the show. I'm going to be catching up with Reflections founder, Martin Edmondson. Now, Reflections, I mean, if you talk about legendary British gaming companies... They do not come much bigger than reflections. Oh God! I like we had a few technical hitches on this one. Um, the, the interview sounds great, but I wasn't able to join Dan, and I wanted to so much because, like Martin <laughs> Edmondson's someone that I've wanted to have on the podcast from the very beginning. Like amazing score. He's such a good developer. Like reflections, you know, they did like ballistic shadow of the beast. They did a uh, destruction derby and driver as well. So they were they came from the Amiga which they really, really pushed to its limits. And then they went into that PlayStation era. They also started on the BBC. And like the main thing about Reflections, I think, is the innovation in the games. They have always Mm. innovated and they've always pushed it to its cutting edge, absolute cutting edge. And like, do you remember the hype when Shadow of the Beast came out and how, how it must have sold a lot of Amigas and it must have got a lot of people involved with just those drawed up dropping graphics but also well that's the thing i remember you know people at school who actually wanted an amiga after they saw that game you know as a graphical demo it was like a showstopper it was amazing but also like destruction derby and driver like driver was such a cool stylish game joe what what were your memories of driver for, for driver for me like me and my brother well my brother loved driver i really struggled with it i found it so hard and I'm really, really hoping that you asked him about like kind of like Driver and its relationship with GTA and kind of coming off the back of that Joe because of... Because just stuck in the tutorial at the beginning. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like 100% stuck in that tutorial trying to do 360s and donuts around the pillars and stuff. Um, but my brother always sold Driver to me as like, it's 3D GTA. 
you know, and this is well before GTA 3 as well. Ultimately, it, it, it wasn't quite like that, you know. But then in number two, you could get out of the car and you could move it, you know, you could steal other cars and stuff like that. Um, there was that element to it. But like, I'm really, really excited to hearing about that and the development of it and kind of like where the idea came from. And if it kind of, I'm hoping you asked if it kind of did start out as kind of like a, we're trying to do a 3D GTA or, you know, what his thoughts were on that. So, and it had um, that like, really um, excited about that kind of 70s cop movie, Starsky yeah, and yeah. Hutch style, you know. Yeah, definitely. The magazines back then always painted that GTA driver kind of rivalry, mm. didn't they? Yeah. They really were hyping that up. So we do go into that with Martin. And that Destruction Derby as well. I mean, that was a very early PlayStation 1 game. Got a feeling that was a launch title on the PS1, wasn't it? I think yeah. it was. And then it was a launch title on the PS5. They redid it, didn't they? Like a little, mm. you know, callback to that. So yeah, I'm excited to hear about that as well. Because I remember playing that game with my brother, mm. you know, when we first got our PlayStation. And it was just because I love racing games anyway, but actually having a driving game where the aim of it was to smash up the cars. Mm. You know, it was like nothing else I'd ever played before. So, you know, as a teenage lad, that's what life was all about. You want to smash cars. It was like the dream come true. Yeah. And like so many companies as well kind of fell by the wayside when they went from the 16 bit to the uh, 32 bit and going into that uh, CD ROM world as well. It was a. Uh, it was really tough. A lot of them went and it was great to kind of play that and see like Psygnosis logos everywhere. <laughs> you know, it's just really cool. Yeah, so uh, it's a really good chat this week. Martin Edmondson, who actually, I've got to say a big thank you to Martin because uh, he's a very busy guy. He was in America last week. Um, we couldn't make the time to work, but this week is actually on a family holiday in Mallorca. He gives an hour of his holiday and he's actually poolside around the swimming pool in Mallorca what a guy. on his phone in this chat. So <laughs> you might hear uh, the kids playing in the background and a bit of splashing water, but you're going to enjoy this week's guest. Reflections founder Martin Edmondson coming up in around 25 minutes from now. Now, the first half of the show, before we get into the interview, we kind of bring you up to speed on everything that's been happening, the main headlines in the world of retro gaming and technology. And uh, this will be a sound that is all too familiar to anyone who used computers back in the mid to late 90s. Winner. Winner. It really whips the llama's ass. What memories does that bring back, Ravi? Oh, God, so many. Like, Winamp for me was, and for many people, was kind of the player that was associated with downloading the MP3s. When you got your two tunes off Napster a night, you put them in Winamp. And uh, what an amazing moment for me when I was a kid was I went to a, a LAN meeting where we all actually got our PCs and, you know, put them in your parents' car and then got dropped <laughs> off. And uh, being able to download free MP3 not a night wasn't enough. You know, we, we turned up and these guys hooked me up to the LAN and then suddenly I had thousands of MP3s arriving and I'd just be scrolling through Winamp and it was a bit like, you know, a sign of your prowess how many MP3s you had. Um, but it was it was a great piece of software i even remember icecast on there which was like people doing radio streams um yeah there was also a, a there was a like video casting service where people would play like simpsons episodes uh shoutcast as well they'd be playing like simpsons episodes 24 hours and you could tune into like a really low quality feed and watch stuff on there it was it was really, really innovative, and uh, it was an essential tool. And, man, I, I just want Winamp back. Is it back? It is. And, actually, we've talked about this before, because this, to me, sounded very like, haven't we done this in the news a couple of years ago? Because, do you remember, I think it was in around 2018, they brought back, like, a web version of Winamp, briefly. And they said it was like a, a new company got the, the brand They'd released like a version. They kept promising a proper update, but that never happened. So now it actually turns out you can download a new version of Winamp that runs on modern machines. The code base under the hood, that's been rewritten in Visual Studio 2019. Um, that means that you do need Windows 7 Service Pack 1 or later to run it. So, you know, it's not going to run on Windows 98 or XP. But they're now saying this is kind of a, a new generation of Winamp. Although looking at it, it doesn't look like all that much has changed so far, I've got to say. But they are saying that apparently they're hoping that they're going to be able to integrate streaming services into this as well. Wow. So whether like in a few months' time or a few different revisions' time, you'll be able to kind of put your Spotify library into there. I guess that's kind of the aim, depending on uh, kind of how open their APIs are and that kind of thing. Well, that was the thing. It was just consistent, wasn't it, when I'm like, it didn't change for all those kind of years. And then I guess like when VLC came out and stuff, 
um it kind of like went out of trade uh trend or like um itunes as well and stuff like that but i i love winamp and i think there's a lot of love and nostalgia for it and the fact that you'll be able to run it on new machines that's that's amazing do you remember winamp joe or um, i i feel really uninitiated here like you know i'm I'm a little bit younger than uh, than you guys and um I don't, I recognize it, like looking at it now, I, you know, I recognize the, you know, the UI and stuff, but when you played that advert, I was like, oh my God, I'm completely out of my depth here. And then, you know, and then I started chuckling to myself and Ravi said, you know, he gets his PCs and his parents' car and stuff. Can I imagine like 14 year old, 10 year old Ravi just being like, I'm online, I'm on Winamp, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. at his friend's well, house. <laughs> well, also like, you know, it, it had a whole culture surrounding it. So stuff like Weird Al Yankovic kind of mm. remixes of, tunes and like these hyper <laughs> hyper nerdy kind of music stuff and that was all shared and there was like like parody songs that were released and stuff and you see, uh, yeah you, it was I'm, all part you know, of that I'm, mp3 culture intertwined I'm, you know i'm familiar with all that but i was such a lime wire boy you know in like that early to mid 2000s unfortunately um so i was probably seeing like the second round of all those songs you yeah, know like i said the yeah. weird songs and the uh tom green parody songs and stuff like that they probably all started on Winamp and then went yeah. on to LimeWire. The thing is, as well, I mean, back then, I don't think it was the same. We all kind of group of friends, but kind of MP3 hoarding mm. was definitely a thing. And, you know, obviously swapping them with your friends and stuff as well. But kind of who had the biggest MP3 collection kind of became oh, a bit of yeah, a, yeah, yeah. A, a sign of a... yeah. Because these tunes weren't findable online. So I even remember going to parties and these were like cool parties with cool people. It wasn't like a nerd party. We'd turn up and there'd be a PC in the corner with Winamp with thousands of MP3s and that would be hooked up to the sound system and then people would go up and queue their tune up uh, <laughs> what they wanted to play like it sounds so mad now when you can just like go on Spotify or just pick a tune off even YouTube but uh, yeah back then because the connections weren't that good you know that, that was your way to have this massive library of music well here's a question who still has a big stash of MP3 files on the computer God, I, I don't I even don't, think I do. No, no, I don't anymore. I might have a few flack tunes, but I don't. I don't. Oh, yeah. I've still got my collection from 1999 onwards. Oh wow, that's impressive. Yeah. Or oh, is it impressive? I don't know. I don't, <laughs> tragic. Yeah, one of the two. Is the quality really, really bad? <laughs> yeah, there are some kind of CDs that I ripped. You know, in um, I always did them at like at least 160, even back then. You know, when I just had like a God, I think I had like a four or five gigabyte hard disk on my machine. And I'd, I'd rapidly fill it up. Some like 28 um, kilobits or something like so just Yeah, I mean, really I always made like sure there were at least like one. Quality. <laughs> Even when I downloaded them off Napster, I always aimed for like, you know, 128. It, but again, that took a while. I mean, it'd take a good, you know, hour or something to download them at least. But yeah, I've still got my collection. Must admit, I don't really use it all that often, but I've got it all on my, my NAS drive. It's all kind of sitting up there. And occasionally, because I've got a lot of kind of old DJ mixes, that are on there, or maybe recordings of like, you know, um, essential mixes off Radio 1 from back in the day and stuff like that, that I'll, uh, I'll occasionally fire up. Um, FUBAR 2000 is generally my um, music player of choice. Although the old Winamp versions do actually still work Ooh. on Windows 11, which um, I don't know if many people realise that, but you can actually still run kind of, uh, you know, Winamp version 2 from 1999-2000 on modern-day Windows. I play it a works, lot of actually. my stuff on VLC, but it just feels kind mm. of soulless to me because it hasn't got that. It's more a video player, yeah. isn't it, VLC? It yeah. feels like, yeah. Yeah, FUBAR 2000 is good, but Winamp, I think, you know, for a whole generation, it's just such a nostalgic look. Although I am looking, the company that actually owns Winamp now, if you look at their Twitter feed, they're really going down the kind of NFT route. Oh, God, of course. So they're getting they well into that, which a lot of people are like, Ooh. We'll have to but, play um, guess the next piece of odd software that's going to become an NFT. Yeah, <laughs> like like Kazaa, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so interesting. But it is cool to see they're actually updating that kind of core product and bringing it back again. So um, should run flawlessly on your modern machine. So if you want to get hold of that, uh, that new version of Winamp is available now. And I'll put the link to the article and the download link in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, this is a really cool story. Obviously, you're our kind of resident Streets of Rage fan, Joe. But on the other side, I mean, if you didn't have a Mega Drive, if you had a Super Nintendo, it was all about Final Fight back in the day. Although, I was thinking before, I thought, because this, this headline is at Final Fight is now coming to the Mega Drive. I was like, didn't it actually come out on the Mega Drive? But it turns out it was only on the Mega CD. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I don't want to get into a whole history lesson here of Final Fight and <laughs> Streets of Rage and stuff. But yeah, no, you're, you're totally right there, Dan. Um, 
final fight came out in the arcade in um I say total history of it. I'm not, I'm not a complete expert. I'm pretty sure it came out in 89 in the arcade. Um, mm-hmm. And then a few years later, 91, 92 time, we got the Super Nintendo port and the Sega CD port. So a lot would argue the Sega CD port is, you know, the closest you could get to the arcade. And the main thing is it had the two player uh, co-op on there, whereas the Super Nintendo version, which is obviously probably the more affordable version at the time and still is now, You could only play one player, level four was missing, and one of the main characters was missing. You couldn't play as Guy. You could only play as Cody and Hagar. And then there was a a new released version for the Super Nintendo, like a year later, called Final Fight Guy, where you could play as Guy, but you couldn't play as Cody. Um, They just couldn't fit it all on the cartridge. Um, And obviously then there's the Sega CD version, where you got everything, but it it wasn't quite arcade perfect. But this is Final Fight Ultimate, uh, which is an upcoming Sega Mega Drive project which is meant to be arcade-like version of Final Fight, but on the Mega Drive, which mm. is, you know, really, really exciting. So, so far, we've got essentially a four-minute video of the first level playing in two-player. And this is obviously a fan project. It's not Sega putting out a new Sega Mega Drive game, which would be absolutely amazing. Um, but this comes from a couple of guys. So this is uh, Ray Costello. I, I believe his name is um, Muro Xavier. And then Master Lin Kuei, who we've actually spoke about before on the show. Um, uh, essentially remastering this game and essentially they're actually using like arcade port um, arcade assets and Sega CD assets to kind of recreate the game not completely create the game from the ground up but they're using assets which are already available and then they're and then Master Lin Kuei is doing a whole new soundtrack but imitating copying the original soundtrack but using the Mega Drive hardware so when you right. when you kind of watch it and listen to it it is the original soundtracks of the game but in the Mega Drive, and you can really tell it's that Mega Drive. Like I always call it the twang, you know, that like heavy guitar twang. Yeah, yeah. That the Mega it's Drive kind of a gave bit grungy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can definitely hear that in there. But what's really cool is that they're, they're not cutting any corners. So you've got all the levels in there. You've got all three characters in there, and the biggest thing for me is that it is two player as well. And there's also, by the looks of things, from the description of reading it, there is also going to be a two player mode where the computer is control controlling player two as well in an ai mode um which is really interesting oh, wow. um and this is going to be running on the mega drive you know through everdrive and and actually running on you know mega drive hardware um which is just it's so cool like i know this game's you know 33 years old now and it's on 33 year old hardware but it's just insane to see what people can make you know, these fan projects, you know, and I, I get it, the technology's changed and stuff like that, but ultimately it's it's playing, it gets condensed and plays on the original, you know, on the original hardware, which I just think is absolutely fantastic. And, you know, I think it's going to be really cool and there is easier ways to play, you know, the arcade version now on like the Xbox 360 and the Xbox One and there was even a Game Boy Advance port of it as well, uh, which was fully two-player with all the characters and stuff. So, you know, it's not necessarily needed, but it's just really cool to see it playing on a Mega Drive and having, as I call it, the Mega Drive twang to the soundtrack. It certainly uh, beats the Amiga port. Oh, yeah, there is. An, yeah, we've seen that before and spoke about it. Yeah, it definitely beats that. <laughs> I wonder why it didn't come out on the Mega Drive back in the day. Yeah, interesting. You know that they, they did do it on the Sega CD, but not the Mega Drive. You know, you, you would have thought if they've got it running on the Super Nintendo, then they could do it on the Mega Drive. And it's Capcom as well. It's not like it's a small... You know, they they weren't a small company. You know, they were one of the biggest third party companies in the world. So it is odd that they did go for the Sega CD unless they were convinced the future was in the Sega CD at the time. Misled by someone. Yeah. Maybe a Sega. Yeah, this is going to be huge yeah. while they the really streets of rage on the side. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Because I do remember kids at school. I mean, there was definitely a rivalry between mm. them. You know, the, the kids who had Mega Drives would be, you know, boasting about Streets of Rage. But the amount of kids that, you know, I knew a couple of had Super Nintendo, there's not that many. But they'd always be like, oh, you know, Final Fight is a way better game. But I think there is something very cool about actually getting a game that was never released on a system back then and was kind of, you know, seen as a bit of a system exclusive, even though it did come out in the Mega CD, finally making it over to the other side. There is some, always something very cool about yeah, that. Yeah, there's always something like kind of mind-blowing about that, you know, even mm. for me when I kind of got back into collecting, like at the time as I saw it as retro, but when I was like a, in my late teens, early 20s, you know, I didn't know that there was even a Sega CD version of it. It wasn't until I was older that it's like, oh my God, there's a Sega CD version of like one of my favorite Super Nintendo games. Like, 
And now it's just like, I just know if I found out about this when I was like a young guy and the Game Boy Advance version came out, it would have just blown my mind that it could run on the Mega Drive. I'm just waiting for someone to port Super Mario World to the Mega Drive now. Oh, I'm sure it's been done. <laughs> <laughs> There's a challenge. So yeah, it looks really cool. If you want to check out that work in progress, do you know if that's going to be a free game then? I imagine, I imagine so. Going to yeah, it. I don't think yeah. they'll be able to charge for that with Capcom and stuff. So I, I imagine it'll be yeah. free. Hopefully it'll fly under the radar if it's going to be a free yeah, release. Yeah. So um, yeah, work in progress looks really, really good so far. Now, what about this for going real old school? What is generally regarded as the first ever video game you can now play on your analog pocket. Yeah, do, do you guys know much about uh, Space War? Only from guests who we've had on the show. You know when we get like real old school guests on who kind of started on the mainframe era? They always credit Space War with being the game they played on their university systems and stuff yeah. out of hours. So, so it's um, yeah one of the most important and most influential video games uh, in early video gaming, and it was done in 1962 on the mainframe. Wow. So... It was basically uh, programmed and designed by Steve Russell. The whole idea behind it was uh, it was a little battle between two spaceships and you just had to basically shoot each other. Um, it was designed on mainframe machines that were really uncomfortable to use. Uh, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So I actually went to the uh, Computer History Museum in America and played Space War on one of the old PDP-1s. The controls, my God, you, you will get cramp off those. They were not, they were not built for it. And it used to, it's so old. It used to run on tape, uh, and uh, and yeah. I don't mean analog tape. I mean paper tape. So uh, like punch cards. punch carded <laughs> tape that you'd actually like ticker tape, and you put it in the machines. And then a uh, space war ended up getting distributed in other mainframes as well. But it was like a direct influence for games like Computer Space, Asteroids and the later ones so it's a really interesting kind of piece of history and uh yeah i mentioned computer space there obviously that was the first arcade machine by atari wasn't it so obviously that was directly influenced by yeah and i and i think you know people must have hated space war when it came out because imagine you've spent all this money on a huge mainframe and the students are like locked in there playing this like game <laughs> and you're just like right we need this for research or like we spent a hundred like, million yeah, dollars on that machine what are you doing and they're all like space war like, <laughs> chasing after, green after lines pub, yeah <laughs> but now you can actually play this at home then yes yeah i think there's been many ports but you can actually play a portable version of space war without a controller that's gonna absolutely wreck your hands yeah so it's coming to the analog pocket which, I, you know, you could say is a uh, a little bit of a, an odd choice, but the CEO of Analog, uh, Chris Taber, has said pretty much, you know, he kind of wanted to do it because of, as you say, it was this mainframe computer game, so it's kind of like bringing it to the masses and bringing the history to the masses. And, you know, and he, he goes on, he did a, uh, a you know, an interview with The Verge, and he's essentially saying something that we're really into, it's about preservation as well and kind of bringing it to the masses so people can see this is the first ever video game. Like video games is such a huge, you know, thing these days, biggest media in the world. Where did it all start? Started with Space War. Yeah. And um, it's, it's interesting because like Space War was on the vector display, kind of like a, yeah. uh, a mainframe style one or a uh, oscilloscope or Vextrex, but um, it's coming out on an OLED screen. So I wonder how different it's going to look. And actually, maybe o- OLED might actually work quite well for that on the uh, out of that I, pocket. I, I think they've captured it quite well, you know, and, you know, they've even got like the blur to the spaceships kind of flying around. But w- what he does go on to say is this is it's not like a remake or anything like that. It is an actual port of the hardware, you know, because it's it's in public domain. The, uh, the original kind of like hardware for it and stuff, the original coding and all that is there. So that's what they've made it from. Um, and he said it was really hard to do it. And just because of like, obviously it was built on like vector graphics and stuff like that originally. So it was really hard to port it over, like you say to like the, uh, the OLED and stuff like that. It also begs that question of like, is it really going to sell that well or, you know, download that well? Are people just going to kind of look at it and go, oh yeah, cool. And then that's it. <laughs> like, Have you played it before, Jeff? I haven't, no. Is it... Re- I was going to say, is it really addictive? It is really good. It's really playable. Like, the whole thing is, you've got to fight... Like, if you played Asteroids, you've got to fight uh, the enemy, but you've got to kind of use the right thrust. And and it's very, like, the floatiness of it being in space uh, kind of makes it really 
competitive and uh yeah it is actually an amazingly playable game for like being so early i have heard stories about people that kind of went into a zen like kind of state playing it <laughs> you know, like back Space in the day you kind of, <laughs> yeah like lose yourself in it so i do think it's a very especially if you're doing something like the analog pocket like like you said which aims to preserve this history i think having you know what is regarded as the first ever game on there is definitely a good addition to the library and obviously having a really simple way for modern players to kind of look back on it i think it's very cool yeah, as may- well. maybe we'll see some more of this like i do think like asteroids is an ideal fit for something like that but um maybe we'll see more of these like mainframe games or or you know decent adventures like a 3d monster maze and uh colossal caves and stuff like that well i think you know we've kind of everything from the 80s and 90s seems to have been re-released so why not go back a bit further to the 60s um, so yeah. you got <laughs> Yeah, so if you've got an analog pocket, um, it's coming to you very soon. Apparently, there's going to be a new update to it, um, to the analog pocket as well, that adds uh, stuff like save states and all that too. So, uh, yeah, it looks very good. Think, so I'll link uh, that up in our show notes. We need to get one, don't we? An analog pocket. Check them out. There you go. For the for the flight to Norway in a couple of weeks' time, Ravi, <laughs> when we head off to Retro Mesa. All, all three of us which might stuck be good... on Space War. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, little mini land party on the plane. Which might be a good time to mention, actually, that we are off to Norway in uh, or two weeks' time, uh, heading out to do some live panels at an amazing retro event called Retro Mesa. Yes, um, it's going to be in uh, Sandjiford, Norway. And uh, Joe's first time in Norway, so I've been telling him... Um, that essentially it's like a Viking film and <laughs> you know, we're, we're going to be going on a longbow and uh, enjoying the whole place. No, it's going to be awesome. Uh, really nice place. Great to kind of be in that kind of part of the world and great to be doing events as well, actually. Yeah, so if you haven't been before, if you're anywhere near Sandyford in Norway, it um, happens on the weekend of the 20th and 21st of August. Or even if, like, you know, you're, you're a plane journey away. I mean, it's like, what, an hour 15 from the UK? Um, if you want to try something a little bit different. And we're going to be doing loads of panels there. The guys from Rare are going to be there. We've got John St. John, Duke Nukem. He's going to be on stage with us. We're going to be doing our own panel on the Sunday, too. There's a big retro gaming market, loads of games that you can play as well. So if you want to get tickets for that, I will link that up in our show notes at theretrohour.com. And it'd be nice to see some people in person again after uh, God, about what when was the last event we did on stage, like back in 2019, yeah, I yeah. think. So <laughs> it'd be nice to get back out there as well. And if you want something to listen to on your journey to Retro Mesa, just a quick heads up that we do have a new episode of our second podcast that we do each month, The Retro Hour After Hours, available right now. And actually this time, quite an interesting theme that we did. We talked about the best video game sequels of all time yeah that was really interesting because dan you were a little bit worried you were like well you know every every sequel in the video game world is better than the previous game kind of thing but um i kind of put it out to our listeners on socials as well and kind of blew up a little bit um which i I really really loved and a lot (laughs) of uh similar answers to uh what we all said which i thought was really cool um but yeah if you want to listen to that that is our latest after hours which you know, we really got our teeth stuck into that, stuck into that. I think it was about two hours long in the end that episode was. It was a big one. But um, what are we thinking of doing next time? Well, we're thinking that we will play games that our patrons pick for mm. us. So I'm going to put a little poll on our, on our um, Discord and on our Patreon page. If you've got any suggestions of games, maybe stuff that we haven't played before be, that be we can kind, kind of give guys. our reviews of. <laughs> <Be kind. laughs> yeah, We're thinking someone's going to give Ravi like Rise of the Robots 2 or something. I, I just feel like somebody's going to make me play a load of Amiga and I'm just going to have to go out and get Amiga 500 <laughs> or something. I'll loan you one, Joe. There we I've go. got plenty of Save around. me some money. But yeah. <laughs> so if you hop onto our, our uh, Patreon, um, this weekend, that poll will be on there if you want to suggest some games for us to play. And then not only do you get access to the After Hours podcast for getting us on Patreon, uh, being a gold member or above, but really the main reason that we have a Patreon is obviously to keep the lights on, just to make sure that we can keep bringing this show out each and every week for you. And uh, there's some other big perks that you get for backing us on Patreon too. Yeah, you also get the episode early some weeks. You also get completely ad-free episodes, so you know you don't have to listen to any of those pesky ads or anything like that. Um, you also get our monthly hangout, which we usually do on the last Sunday of the month, which, you know, we've said it before, it's a little bit like a, a pub hangout, hanging out with mates. We all get a drink, we all get some snacks, and we just kind of, I don't know, we lose ourselves talking retro. Sometimes we talk about films, retro tech, retro mobile phones, stuff like that. 
But yeah, all sorts of perks on there. And you kind of hear about what we've got coming up project wise and stuff a little bit early, you know, in complete access to our Discord as well, which is really cool. A couple of uh, yeah. extra stories as well. Yeah, on, uh, yeah. On the uh, episode. So, you know, you, you get a lot for your money with the retro hour. <laughs> you get the retro two hour. <laughs> So any help that we get on Patreon, obviously it all massively makes a big difference to this show. And really, we couldn't do it without our Patreon. It is that simple. So anything you can spare, that really, really helps us out. And of course, for backing us on Patreon, you will get a mention in the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming. And that is Hall of Fame. the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. And one new backer to give a massive shout to this week. Thank you so much to Gerardo Rodriguez, who backed us on Patreon. If you'd like to join him and join the Retro Hour Patreon community. All the details are at theretrohour.com. Now, recently, it does seem like there has been a bit of a craze in retro first-person shooters. Been a lot of these coming out recently, and this one looks very cool. This one's called Compound. Yeah, this looks really, really cool. So this is a a, a VR game, which is on Steam VR and is also coming to the Quest 2. It pretty much looks like to me, it's it's very in the vein of like, you know, early FPSs like Wolfenstein and, and Doom. And the graphics are like, a. I can only describe them as like, they're like pixel graphics, but they're really, really beautiful. And it, it, it looks like a mix between Sprite and 3D, um, which I can imagine being a little bit trippy uh, when you're playing the colors <laughs> as playing well. that in VR. But it is a, yeah, like you say, a really bright, colorful game. And it looks really fun and really interesting, and it's getting a lot of good reviews. It came I, out a couple of days ago. I think it looks like there was a certain era of PC games where kind of CD-ROM had got a bit bigger, mm. and uh, like like games like Normality and stuff like that. And they had this kind of really colourful, cartoony kind of uh, vibe to it. And it, it's got that, but it's also got that. Yeah, you're right. Like pixel kind of uh Duke Nukem style but obviously it's all at a much higher resolution because yeah. of uh, a VR so this is kind of like something that we haven't seen before and I've been out of the VR game for so long I really I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of jumping back in and this would be a ideal kind of title look, for me look, look, looks like a good place to jump back in so you know the reviews are in and they're, they're pretty good you know lots of nines out of tens and stuff like that it just looks really fun so the aim of the game is essentially um, and the story of your game is you're a low level like worker for like a big evil corporation who are essentially, you know, making super soldiers and zombies and stuff and, you know, out of slime and goo, essentially, it says. Yeah, yeah, and lots standard of, kind of stuff. Standard bad guys corporation. <laughs> and you start off in the sewers of this huge building and it's very in the vein of Die Hard. You're, you're the bottom level and you're working your way up the tower. And as you get higher and higher. Um, you fight more security and stuff like that, but you start in the sewers and by the end of it, you're at the top of the tower. And the aim of the game is to just clear every floor. So you have to kill every enemy on every floor to progress to the next floor. Quite a short game. Apparently only takes about 40 minutes to an hour to run through it. But I know a lot of VR games are like that. Um, and it does save it. You can save it at any point. So you can just take your headset off and carry on with it, you know, when you want to later on. But it, it's got, different difficulty settings so you can play the game you know on very easy all the way up to like a nightmare mode and apparently that does really change the dynamic of the game the nightmare mode being really you know you kind of like have to be up on your feet really kind of like looking around the corner you know making sure you don't actually get shot really taking the game seriously whereas the easy mode you can kind of sit in your office chair and just running guns ablaze and just blowing everything away with double uzi kind of thing and just like be like an that's my mode yeah that's my mode as well but there's also a lot of like game changing things in there you can take different syringes which essentially alter the way the game plays so you can have a lot more enemies but they all only have one hp so there's absolutely loads of enemies everywhere but just one shot will kill them or you can have you know a couple of enemies who are really really strong who you have to shoot all the time i like the idea of lots of enemies that you're just blown away with your guns uh it just looks really really fun it looks a lot more established like when i was first playing vr and stuff mm. it was you had to set the floor up and make sure you weren't going to fall into it and like stuff would glitch and like playing FPSs and stuff was kind of like a dream. I'd, I'd, I'd play like bow and arrow games and stuff like that. You know? <laughs> yeah. And I was still kind of tethered to the thing. So I can imagine this just even looking at the videos of it, it looks so smooth and it looks uh, like it wouldn't actually make me feel ill. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, stuff like that. Well, if you think about like VR gaming, it kind of feels like the first-person shooter is like one of the most logical genres to play in VR. Yeah, yeah, no, I'd agree with that, but I've not 
I think I've played maybe one in yeah. VR, which is interesting you should say that. But, you know, some people might be thinking, why are they talking about this new game? But it is the retro look of it, you know. It, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's, 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 it's retro styled, but it's yeah. in a new a new dimension. Yeah, 3D. <laughs> <laughs> And if you think about those kind of 90s FPS games, I mean, obviously the pace of them is quite a bit slower mm. than playing something like, you know, Call of Duty today. But I think, again, that probably lends itself better to VR because otherwise it would just seem, you know, if you had like about 50 enemies on the screen at the same time and everything, and it would get a little bit overwhelming. So I think that kind of the slower pace well, of a I, 90s VR game for, probably lends For some itself. reason, the graphics remind me of Theme Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> those colours yeah, yeah, yeah I can start like, to see like, that kind of like in, yeah. a, in a version of Theme Hospital as well shooting everything <laughs> <laughs> if you want to play Theme Hospital shoot everybody up play Compound that's, that's, that's Ravi's the next one VR <laughs> Hospital yeah so it's getting some very good reviews so far so if you want to play a, a 90s style FPS game in VR is available now on Steam VR and coming to the Quest 2 very soon and I'll link up that article in our show notes at theretrohour.com now, one of my favourite genres of video games as a kid was always pinball games. And I've got to say, actually having a decent pinball simulator on a computer is pretty tricky. There weren't many that did it very well, I don't think. But there were a few games on the Amiga in particular that I remember that actually were really good home simulations of Pinball machines. Slam Tilt, I've got to say, was probably my favourite back then. Didn't you feel played that rather? That's Yeah, that's always your test. Dan always goes like, right, I'm going to test the emulation on this, see how it is. I'm going to play like Slam Tilt or Pinball Fantasies. <laughs> if the, and you can tell with the ball and the way that it's going and like the kind of smoothness. And I think that's a whole genre that we've we've kind of lost for a bit. You know, the, the pinball games on machines, like I, I really did enjoy them as well. And... Uh, well, we're talking about this because there's this Pinball Fantasies mini table. Now, this looks crazy. It's like, it's about the size of a phone. Um, and it's mm. probably using a phone screen as well. Um, I'm not sure, but I've I've seen these kind of recreations. I saw a huge one, which was a, a, it was like a virtual pinball table. And it had like a giant screen on there. And that was also playing stuff like Pinball Fantasies and stuff. But um this is in like miniaturized form, isn't it? Yes, I mean, Slam Tilt was probably my favorite, but I think before that, yeah, Pinball Fantasies and Pinball Dreams, those digital illusions games, first time I played them, I mean, I hadn't played anything that kind of felt like actual pinball. Because it's a hard thing to get right, I think, on, you know, the weight of the ball and everything and the gravity. I think it got that really nailed in those games. But this is, yeah, I'll link it up in the show notes. It's on a website called spritemods.com. Someone has made a miniature pinball fantasies table and actually there is a video that's about 50 seconds long where the creator of it explains it so i thought why don't we hear from him this is my tiny pinball fantasies table the case is 3d printed on a resin printer with some brass rods used as the feet and inside the plunger mechanics there's an esp32 s3 inside that runs the show it has an x86 emulator that is just able to run the dos version of pinball fantasies and it's custom built to show the playfield and backbox on the two LCDs you see here. It has an actual plunger to launch the ball and haptic feedback so you can feel the virtual ball bounce around. It can play all four pinball fantasy tables at the original 60 frames per second and you don't even need miniature quarters to play them. More information as usual on spritesmods.com how insane does this look? I, I Not only is it, it completely playable. It's the DOS version. <laughs> no, I think, I the DOS version awesome. was pretty decent, actually. Yeah, yeah the, I didn't mind the DOS version of it. But the fact that he's got the little flippers on the side that you can kind of press probably with your little pinky fingers, um, a little plunger there that actually it's you the know, plunger. fires the ball. It's the plunger that gets me that fires the balls. <laughs> Disappointed that he's not made tiny quarters for it, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, it displays... Uh, at the top as well, and it's got the kind of points light up there and stuff. Uh, the little marquee as well, which is pretty cool. It does look an in insanely advanced project. I mean, something that, you know, I, I can't imagine how he got a list of working together. It's way beyond my understanding, but yeah, it does look very cool. I think one thing I like about it as well is he kind of fits the entire screen of Pinball Fantasies onto the lower display. Because normally in that game, it kind of scrolled on your monitor, didn't it? I've, I've never really played it where it's, the whole thing's full screen before. Yeah, true, actually. So it's kind yeah. of nice to there see was, that. There was always that scroll. And like, I love the kind of just the connection of like, you know, we, we, we're getting mini consoles. We're getting like uh, you know, miniature versions of everything. 
of course there's going to be a miniature pinball machine and it's going to play pinball fantasies. Yeah, I, I love that. And having that haptic feedback in there as well, to so actually feel when the ball is hitting the the bumpers and stuff like that, I think is a very, very cool idea as well. So I don't know about you guys, whenever we go to like, you know, play expos and that kind of thing, I'm always really drawn to the pinball table. Yeah, well, when I, when I went to America, God, the whole pinball culture there is absolutely massive. And like, I think we, we have it in the UK, but not to that level. Like there's still new machines being produced. And that kind of crossover with pinball and video games was always really tough um like you know the, the pinball machines tried to get more video game technology in them and the video games tried to emulate pinball machines <laughs> it's like a interesting kind of crossover yeah I, I think this is really cool and always something that you felt like you couldn't have at home because it's like i mean at a push i could maybe fit an arcade cabinet in this room I couldn't fit a full-size yeah, pinball you, table in here if, if, if you want to hands. annoy the wife then get a pinball machine <laughs> Or if you want to keep her on your good side, make one of these mini ones. Yeah. So um, all the instructions are actually available on this website. So I'll link that up in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, we are going to be joined by this week's very special guest, Reflections founder, Martin Edmondson, coming up on the show in just a minute. Before we do that, though, maybe you've got a bit of travelling to do soon. Like you said, we're off to Norway. Uh, we're going to Germany in a couple of months as well. That'll be, you know, lots of time sitting at airports and sitting on planes and being bored. Maybe you need a good poolside book for your holiday, or maybe just a book to look really cool on your coffee table and celebrate a genre of gaming that is back, big style at the moment. We're, of course, talking about point-and-click adventure games. And this is our lovely sponsor, Bitmap Books. Now, I mentioned that, you know, it does feel like point-and-click adventure games have had a real resurgence recently. We mentioned that new Simon the Sorcerer game coming out soon. New Monkey Island in the works as well. It kind of feels like the most exciting time in point and click adventure games that I can remember for years right now. It, it's interesting. Like pinball games, it's kind of a genre that, you know, disappeared. But now it is definitely coming back. And it's great to kind of look back on those. You know, I was playing Thimbleweed Park and uh, that, oh, that was such an awesome title. Yeah, but uh, there's so many good ones there as well, like Grim Fandango and like some of the later ones. Discworld. Uh, Disc world, yeah, yeah. There's some uh, fantastic titles out there, so it's it's great to have a book celebrating this genre. And of course, this is Bitmap Books, and you know, I, I don't think we're going to be too biased to say that they do the best quality retro gaming books. Every one I get from them, it's just like a real work of art, and it celebrates the look, the pixel art, the classic scenes from the best point and click adventure games. And actually, they've just released their third edition of the Art of Point and Click Adventure Games featuring an additional 28 pages and some additional interviews in there as well with legends like Dave Grossman, Dave Gilbert, lots more as well, and some additional games in there too. There's about another six or seven games they've included. So if you're a fan of Point and Click Adventure Games, this book, a real celebration of that genre, clocking in at over 530 pages. This is an absolute must-have for fans of point-and-click adventure games. And you can check that book out, order it right now, and the rest of their retro gaming books on their website at bitmapbooks.com. Right then, next, we're going to be going inside Reflections, getting memories of the Driver series, Destruction Derby, of course, Shadow of the Beast as well, and lots more as we go poolside in Mallorca with our special guest this week, Reflections founder, Martin Edmondson. He's next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time for our favourite bit of the show when we welcome on our very special guest. And it's an honour to be joined, uh, not only taking the time out of his holiday, Paul Side in Mallorca to talk to us by uh, Reflections founder, Martin Edmondson. How are you doing, Martin? Good, thank you. Yeah, very good. I hope you've got a nice cool drink in your hand if you Paul Side uh, on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's very hot, but uh, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> Well, uh, I mean, let's kind of get into, you know, these these incredible companies and these games that you've worked on. But before we do that, I mean, we always kind of like to get a bit of a, a background on our guests and find out where it all started for them. I mean, kind of going back to day one, what was your first ever gaming experience? And do you remember what got you into it in the first place? Uh, yes, I mean, it, it was actually, um, it was the arcades. So uh, my, my first recollection of any kind of uh, gaming really was... Um, when we used to go to the local swimming pool or the, the ice rink or whatever when we were very young kids, and they had, you know, the, the stand-up arcade games. And I, the, the one that I remember 
uh, was not was not Space Invaders, which is what most people say, but actually uh, Williams Defender. I nice. think it must have been around that era that I first noticed them. And uh, and although that was quite a complicated game, it had a lot of buttons. Quite, you know, quite a tricky game, really. Um, I just remember being totally transfixed by that thing and the sound effects and the explosions where they all dis, you know, disintegrated into particles and all that. Just, I, I don't know why it hooked me, but that one did. I put a lot, a lot of money into that machine. Yeah, and I think that game as well, I mean, you mentioned Space Invaders then, that just felt like just such a next level from Space Invaders as well, didn't it? Even though there's only a few years between them. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if it, I can't remember, to be honest, if it was just purely a timing thing or whether I'd seen Space Invaders and just wasn't interested in it. But it was a it was a total generational leap going from black and white to uh, to colour, but also just the sort of, you know, the whole thing scrolling and the sound and everything. It was a, It was a massive jump up. And that's the game that sort of grabbed me. But also, I remember um, games like Centipede. Uh, what else was was around that time that I played Robotron? That was another amazing yeah. one that I, I put quite a bit of uh, my uh, lunch money and stuff into that I probably shouldn't have done. But uh, uh, the, the, that sort of generation of of game, and, and it's also when the sound effects really did come off. Because one of my lasting memories of Defender was that sort of growl when you first put the press the start button and the thump thump of the explosions with loads of loads of bass and uh yeah that's uh that's that's where it started really obviously the, the, you know there was no involvement in creating them at that stage it was just what sort of snagged my interest and made me appreciate them and sort of look at them and how they worked really how they worked, pull them apart and eventually that led to to you know writing games and wanting to somehow mimic some of this stuff that was going on and much uh much less advanced hardware. Well, what was your first home system? Um, well, we had, I remember getting a, uh, the, the Binatone um, Pong type thing, which had, uh, had about 10 games on it. And it was Pong, you know, the classic Pong, but there was also like a gridiron game and an a attempt at basketball and, and stuff like that. And it was Binatone that made it. And it was very, very simplistic. It was uh, black and white, if I remember correctly, and it was just all those sort of block graphics, and the ball was a little square, and beep, pop, beep, pop, that that sort of a thing. Mm-hmm. And that was around about that period of time. Uh, but the first actual system, a proper system, computer uh, that I that I owned uh, was uh, my brother and I got for Christmas, um, lucky boys, a um, BBC Micro. And, and that's where it started in terms of having a computer and starting to learn how to program and mess about and experiment. And actually at school, we had uh, ZX80 and ZX81, but I never had one of those at home. But that would have probably been six months to a year, probably a year actually before BBC Micro. I'm talking off the top of my head on dates here. But we, we, were, we had a sort of a school club, computer club, I guess. Um, and they, uh, the, the teacher that ran the club had just got this ZX81 and uh, you know we did a bit of playing around on that at school but uh, mostly just playing games to be honest and a little bit of basic code stuff. I was going to say getting a BBC Micro for your first machine you kind of went in right at the top there. Well yeah you know it's uh, obviously without that there would have been uh, nothing so you know it it was probably the most important moment Um, and and it could have gone different ways because we could have got you know, could have got a Spectrum. We could have got a, a Dragon 64 at that time. We could have got a um, Commodore 64, which would have been pretty good actually. But uh, lots of different things, and some would have sent you in the wrong direction. And uh, but one of the things were, that was great about the BBC was that it was so programmable, and it was so I wouldn't say easy to program, but certainly easy to be able to start programming because the the assembler was built in, and you know it had really decent, fast, basic built-in. So you could you could kind of start straight away, whether something like a Commodore 64 was a bit more of a, a, a mess on for somebody who was a true amateur. You had to, I don't think there was even an assembler built in. I think you'd have to get a cartridge that was an assembler and, and do it that way. But anyway, point being that was that the BBC was just designed to be programmed. Let's talk about your kind of entry into the industry then, because I know you and a friend programmed a Raven Skull, and that was um, that superior software that came out on. I mean, how did you... How did that project start and how did you get in touch with them? Um, yeah, so that was, I mean, we started, uh, I say we, because uh, although it was my brother and I that got the uh, BBC for Christmas, it was a school friend who also had a BBC. His his parents must have bought him it at roughly the same time. So we were both sort of lucky in that we shared the same um, machine. And remember at the time, there were so many different machines and a lot of those companies went bust and disappeared, but we both had the same machine. So 
we'd be around at each other's houses and uh, tinkering around and playing around. And we started just writing little bits and bobs. It started a sort of like a Space Invaders-y sort of game. Didn't get really get very far of it. And then uh, the first game that we sort of designed properly and, and decided to have a proper crack at it and, you know, go to completion on the game um, was, uh, was Raven Skull. So uh, that was... Yeah, that was Superior Software. So uh, they were based in Leeds. I remember we got we didn't totally finish the game, but we got almost I would say ninety percent finished. It took us about six months for the two of us to um, to create that. And uh, I remember just thinking, well, the best company, the best publisher for BBC Micro Games at the time was uh, Acorn Soft or uh, Superior Software. And um, and I think at the time actually. Acorn Soft had been bought by Superior Software. It was probably around then. So anyway, long story short was I just jumped in the car and drove down to, to Leeds to meet with Richard Hansen, who ran Superior Software and showed him the game. And uh, and uh, and he just he, liked, he had a couple of suggestions to improve it, but um, liked it uh, pretty much as it was and said, yeah, we want it. We want to, want to publish it. I've still got the letter from him saying, yeah, we'd like to publish it. So that's one of the few little trinkets I've, I've got from, from the old days. <laughs> nice. Well, obviously, I mean, he did a few more titles for the BBC as well. Um, why did he decide to stick with the BBC Micro? Because I imagine, you know, the Spectrum and Commodore 64 probably had, you know, much bigger gaming communities and you could have sold a lot more on those systems. Yeah, you could. Um, but one of the advantages of being on the BBC Micro is there weren't that many games released uh, for it. Well, you know, not compared to Spectrum and... Uh, the uh, Commodore 64. But on the other hand, well, I say there weren't as many games. There were lots and lots and lots of games made for the BBC, but there weren't that many sort of high-quality arcade-ish games compared to those other systems. So because it didn't have the focus from the gaming community, it did mean that when you released something, if it was high-quality, it got a lot of attention. And because of that, you weren't sort of lost in the mix of of a lot of other games, which... uh, you know, it's something that's happening a lot, say, on mobile in more modern times. But back then, you could see how many releases there were on the Commodore 64. So standing out from the crowd was really quite difficult, whereas on the BBC Micro, you were only really getting one major release, maybe two major releases per month at all. So from that point of view, I suppose it made our uh, our job a bit easier. Well, do you remember the first time you saw a Commodore Amiga? And what was your reaction yes. to that machine? Yeah, so I mean, the first time I saw Commodore Amiga was um, in a, a, a little sort of backstreet computer repair shop called um, Curry and Morn or Morn Micros in Newcastle, and they just they just taken delivery of this thing, and they had Marble Madness running on it, the uh, the original EA conversion. Larry Reed was the programmer that did that, and the whole point was to make it sort of arcade perfect or as close as possible. And I was just blown away by that because I had played Marble Madness in the arcades and it was sort of almost indistinguishable from an arcade game, which I'd never seen before on a, on a home system because all of the, the big games that you would see come out on the 64 and the Spectrum, not so much on the BBC because it wasn't really a, a gaming machine as, as you pointed out, but they would never look anything like the arcade yeah. version. I'd rather spend £10 on the arcade machine than spend £10 on a you know, Commodore, a, a Spectrum conversion of Outrun, you know, for example. But, you know, that that was really arcade perfect, pretty much, give or take. And uh, and I was just blown away by it. And I just thought that, oh, this is a machine. I want to I want to play with this thing and, and you know, learn how to program this and, and produce some stuff on it because it just seemed limitless at the time. Yeah, well, it felt like an arcade machine in your home, didn't it, that machine? Yeah, well, it originally was designed as such, wasn't it? And um, they sold the whole thing to Commodore, and uh, Commodore tried to sort of market it as a business machine for a while. And there was some quite well-documented fallouts between the original designers and Commodore that you can read through on Wikipedia that's quite interesting. But from a point of view of the hardware of that machine with the blitter and the hardware scrolling and the copper code processor that allowed you to do stuff, split screen, this, that, and the other, that we used to quite good effect in Shadow of the Beast in later years, was so clearly designed for video games and not for spreadsheets and stuff let's talk about reflections then and uh, forming reflections where did the name come from originally Uh, yeah so that it's a bit of a i wish there was a better story to this but all it was was i was doing i I did um the the art for the games and i was using a piece of it was either neochrome on the atari st or um or uh, deluxe paint 
on the Amiga. I can't remember which now. And I just drew a silicon chip in space. It wasn't particularly designed for anything. It was just I was drawing a silicon chip in space. And, um, and you could do like a 3D transformation of writing in the, the piece of software. I wish I could remember whether it was near Chrome or, or Deluxe Paint, but I can't. But, and, and I just wrote the word reflection across the screen, tilted it into 3D, and then reflected the word reflection in the top of the microchip. And I thought, oh, that's quite cool how you can do this. And then I, it kind of just stuck and stayed. And, um, uh, and I wish there was something more elaborate to it or some hidden meaning behind it or, or uh, you know, something that was really worth sort of digging into. But that was, uh, it was almost like an accidental name. So when you when you hear the name, you you, you know people used to joke that well you sound like you're um, a hairdressing salon or something you know and and I do wish we'd had something with a bit more umph but anyway that's where it came from from a, <laughs> a drawing that I did of the word reflection on the top of the microchip floating in space. Well, tell us about your relationship with them, Cyclops Sense. I know um, they published uh, Ballistics, and that was um, that was a spin-off label of Cygnosis, wasn't it, Cyclops? Yeah, well, so it really was Cygnosis. It's just that they. At the time, they wanted to keep the Cygnosis name for their internal releases, you know, their big releases like Barbarian, Obliterator, and, and whatnot. And they, they developed this um, a sort of a side brand called Cyclaps, which was for the externally produced games, uh, all the not as big games, you know, that, that were smaller games, easier games, not easier to play, sorry, smaller as in not huge production, puzzle games, things like that. And... Uh, so Ballistics was um, a take on, I think it was our first 16-bit game, actually, and it was a take on the old physical game, Crossfire, where you fired the ball bearings at a little puck. We ha- I had that one Christmas, and I remember you know, playing it with my brother and giving myself a blister from that little gun that used to shoot the, the ball bearings. And, and it was a brilliant, uh, a brilliant physical game to play. So um, we put together a demo using very simple physics for the balls bouncing loads and loads of ball bearings and put a demo together almost finished and i took that to see um ian hetherington at uh, at Cygnosis. and that was partly because i just i wanted to start at the top when it came to publishing because I, I really admired what uh, Cygnosis had done with their their whole sort of branding you know the the black boxes the big boxes the, mm. the roger dean artwork and all that it just seemed so premium and, and almost mysterious at the time. And uh, so rather than mess about going anywhere else, I just thought, right, I'm going to take it to, take it to Cygnosis and see what, they, see what they think. Anyway, the, Ian looked at the game and, and really liked it and just thought, right, well, we'll yeah, we'll publish that for you. No, no problem. I was really excited because I thought, oh, you know, that's, that was sort of my first choice of publisher anyway. And they published it. I can't remember if actually Ballistics was on Cygnosis or on Cyclaps, but it was probably on Cyclaps because it wasn't a, an internally produced big game. And I'd done this quite elaborate logo for the name of the game, Ballistics, uh, spelt with an X at the end. And it was, it was elaborate in a sort of Roger Dean-esque, Rodney Matthews kind of thing with the spiky things off the letters, only because I really admired the, the artwork of uh, Roger Dean. So I kind of copied his sort of style, nowhere near as well, I might add, but, you know, that style. And I think because I'd done that, they then got Roger Dean to do the logo for the game as well, which they didn't tend to bother with well a lot of the cyclops games i think they just got you know other logos but anyway they did it and um and that was quite nice seeing him do that and we chose a piece of artwork for it that was very appropriate to the game with a sort of creature with wings throwing bombs um but that wasn't produced for the game that was uh, i found that in a fantasy art book somewhere uh, somebody right was the artist i don't remember his uh, full name but anyway it was a very suitable piece of artwork we used that and roger dane did the um the artwork, the artwork for it. So although it was Cyclops, it was still Cygnosis. It was a very internal thing, the, the way they did uh, they did that. It was the same people, the same team, same company. Well, speaking of, you know, jaw-dropping games that I remember on the Amiga, obviously Shadow of the Beast, the amount of systems that game must have sold back in the day after people saw that in a shop and then their jaw just dropped when you saw that parallax scrolling and that incredible <laughs> stylish game. I mean, tell us a bit about the background on that then and assembling the team. I mean, what, what kind of happened there? Well, there wasn't so much of an assembling of team because it was, um, it was, we, we just, we were a bunch of school friends and some were involved and some weren't and some, you know, they would go off to university and or come back from university and or abandon the course at university or whatever. So it was a sort of a, a changing, rolling team, really. But that, that, what, that started from 
I got hold of the um, Amiga hardware reference uh, manual, the Addison Wesley book, when I was nowhere near really writing anything on the Amiga. It was, it was still one of those things that as soon as I'd seen the Amiga and seen what it was capable of by watching Marble Madness, I wanted to be able to work on it. So I got hold of that hardware reference manual, read it back to back, and then designed what I thought was going to be possible with the parallax scrolling. So I talked before about the Copper co-processor that allowed you to split the screen and then with it having hardware scrolling, which I was never used to from the BBC Micro, which, you know, did have hardware scrolling, but it only eight pixels at a time. So it was as good as useless for a lot of purposes. And it, uh, and it just seemed to be uh, perfect for what we wanted to do. And I'd noticed, you know, parallaxing is something that anybody can see by just looking out the side of a train you can see how stuff closer to you is whizzing faster than stuff further away. So I, I just designed it on a piece of paper, really, was where the splits would be, where the, what the speeds would be for each of the uh, the splits, and we ended up with 13 layers and how, how we'd use different play field modes on the Amiga because it was so powerful, it was so flexible, that machine. It had different ways of setting up what could overlay what, how many colors would be in it. And, and people used to talk in terms of the sprites being the most powerful thing, but they weren't at all. The most powerful thing was the code processor and the split screen hardware scrolling and and, uh, and the way that you could have entire screens overlaying it, other entire screens in separate play fields. It was a very, very flexible, powerful gaming machine. So, you know, designed on, designed on paper, we finished whatever game it was that we were working on and, and just got stuck into that as a demo. So that what happened was that, Ballistics had just been recently published, and I took a demo of Shadow of the Beast, which was only the introduction screen. I don't think you could even run around. It was just the ground split up, scrolling, and a tree, and a cloud, and a blimp, and all that stuff. I think I put the Cygnosis logo in just to sort of um, sweeten the pie a bit. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and Ian saw it, and just it was amazing, because he just sort of gathered everybody in the company around it. It was like, oh, you've got to come and have a look at this. You've got to have, have a look at this. And all the technical guys and you know, and the, the marketing guys, everyone was just sort of crowded around it and just, right, we've, well, we've got to do something special with this, which was really nice to see, because I deliberately designed it in a sort of Cygnosis way in terms of the graphics and the fantasy art that barbarian had you know and it was that sort of thing so i suppose from that point of view it was also an easy sell because it had their it had the look of a cygnosis game as well but plus the you know the technical abilities that were afforded by the by the hardware for the nice arcadey scrolling and i remember you know like i mentioned before when i when i first saw that game i was just blown away by the graphics on it because i come from a commodore 8-bit machine i had a commodore 16 before it so All right, you okay, can imagine yeah. kind of what a leap that was seeing shadow of the beast and you know, all my friends were the same. If you wanted to show off what an Amiga would do, you'd put Shadow of the Beast on to show other people. I mean, did you get much of a reaction from Commodore then? Because that must have helped sell a lot of Amigas. Um, yes, it did. I believe I was told it did. And, uh, and I suppose it's believable from the point of view of most Amiga games at the time were ports of Atari ST games. And that was because the Atari ST at the time was a much bigger uh, machine bigger installed base and the Amiga was you know newer and much more expensive therefore you just didn't expect to sell that many on the Amiga and the the approach that we'd taken was if we do a game which is a hundred percent tailored towards this machine and is not going to be physically possible to write on any other machine to play on any other machine then that will appeal to those people so much that it would sell machines or if not sell machines anybody with that machine would buy it because that's a real show it to my mates right this is why this is why my amiga is better than your st that sort of a, a, an approach that sort of a game and i thought it was quite brave of cygnosis as well because they didn't really know they were basically ignoring the st which was the bigger base to publish this game and spend all this money and the t-shirt and the box and all that stuff that uh, came with it on a very small at the time installed base and hope that it was impressive enough to actually get a big um uh, you know, a, a, a big proportion of the owners of the machine buying it. Well, going from Shadow of the Beast 1 to number 2, did you kind of feel more of a um, a focus on gameplay was needed for the second one then? And how did you kind of improve that? Um, yes, I, you know, the first game was, um, you know, I would, I would be the first to sort of uh, acknowledge that the gameplay was somewhat simplistic and it was really a sort of technical tour de force to show off the Amiga's hardware. That's really how it was designed both from the graphics that you've talked about the sound everything was very much pushing the the hardware and the, the visuals and the audios of that machine 
But by doing that, the modes that we'd chosen, the play field system, it limited some of the things that you could do. So, you, you know, you'll notice things like if you punch one of the monsters, he sort of disappears through the ground. He doesn't go flying over the the cliff or whatever. He, he disappears into the ground. And it was partly to do with the technical limitations of how we'd set it up to demonstrate the, the hardware. So we got ourselves in a bit of a box, I suppose, Co- got ourselves in a corner. Uh, which limited the game design quite a lot, and uh, and we were aware that basically there wasn't a lot to it as a game. So the idea with the second game was to give more flexibility on what we could do with things, like what monsters could do, where they could be on the screen, how many of them there could be, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's how the sort of change in graphical approach came to allow us to do more stuff. And we had things like you know, so well by Shadow of the Beast three, we had some really quite advanced. Um, puzzles in there some of them that played out like text adventure type uh, puzzles but in a sort of physical physical way like bursting people out of uh, cells and things like that well obviously by the mid 90s it felt that everyone had to have like a a cutesy animal mascot for a game and uh, reflections did brian the lion there was another game that was published by Cygnosis. what kind of memories have you got of that project then um, well, that, yeah, that was a total break for us. That that, that wasn't um, that was done within the company by one of the artists who wanted to produce a game that was a, a platformer with a cutesy animal, very playable sort of a thing. And I was still very much in the mode of we, you know pushing the hardware. And we had a very very by that time we had a very very uh, technical uh, programmer, a guy called Mike Troughton, who was uh, just very clever with what you could do with um, hardware. And what we were able to do was do sort of both. So it was a it was a platformer with a, a lion with a roar that was so loud that he kind of scared himself and we could do all these funny little things with it. But the hardware stuff was still there. I don't know if you remember all the effects in that game, but we were doing full screen hardware rotation in 60 frames a second, which was something that the Amiga was not supposed to be able to do. But at the time, the Nintendo had just come out and was doing full screen rotation effects and everything. And we showed that game to Amiga, sorry, to Commodore, and they loved it because it was a bit of a, yeah, well, you know, you can do this, but we can do it as well type of a thing. And they took it on as a wanting to um, to box it, you know, with the with the machine. So you would buy the Amiga and you would get Brian the Lion with it. And, you know, and it, it suited them because it was a bit of a show of the graphical power as well. And there was other th- stuff like you could play in levels that were like a rota- the inside of a rotating tube, which was all stuff done with the copper and the hardware scrolling again. But and then overlaying enormous platforms that were t- rotating left and right and all in 60 frames a second. It really, I mean, from a technical point of view, it was way, way, way ahead of Shadow of the Beast. And unfortunately, I'm not sure how sim- if, if it was quite as simple as this, but Commodore basically went bust mm. just before this was uh, launched. So that, that whole deal sort of fell apart and um, really kicked us in the teeth because it was going to be quite a big thing, you know, to have the game sold with and the box you know it was like the commodore amiga box it had brian the lion on it and this that and the other and uh, and it would have been great but anyway it all fell apart sony uh, sorry um commodore went to the wall and uh, and then we just uh, it ended up being published but you know cutesy character just wasn't that appealing and it didn't come anywhere near the expectations or you know the uh, the sales of shadow of the beast but it was quite a long time after that and there were a lot of other amiga games then that were using the hardware so kind of got a bit lost which was a shame. Did you kind of see that coming with Commodore then, or was it quite a shock when they suddenly went under? You could see a bit of it. You could see bits. It was uh, they were competing with bigger with companies that had a lot of money, and you know things were taking off with the the consoles, the, the Nintendo and the Sega consoles, and money was starting. You know they were spending money that Commodore didn't have, and um, I, I wouldn't say that I was expecting them to go pop like they did but uh you you could tell that they weren't going to be able to compete but no it wasn't like a there wasn't a, a sort of a a moment where we thought right this is this is what's happening until it actually happened unfortunately because i had brian the lion on the um the cd32 that was an amiga cd console what did yeah. you what do you think of the cd32 then and um why did you choose to support that system <clears throat> well because it basically was an amiga so it was um it was not hard for us to do it and there was also a little bit of support from Commodore, so they wanted that gay, uh, Brian the Lion to launch on it because, again, like I said, it, it had caught Commodore's eye because of all of the uh, 
the hardware tricks that we were doing and really sort of showing off what the Amiga could do. But it wasn't like the CD version of that machine was any better, really, apart from obviously having the CD drive. The hardware, as far as I can remember, was either identical or very similar. But as a, as a new machine trying to catch attention, you know, they, uh, they offered a bit of um, development and marketing support and uh, stuff, the kind of thing that makes you, makes you say, yeah, tell, we'll, we'll convert it onto that machine because the game was already written and it was using very similar hardware, so it wasn't like a you know, start-from-scratch job or anything. Unlike some of the conversions of you know, Shadow of the Beast, for example, that went on to 13 different formats, and some of them just must have been an absolute nightmare to <laughs> start from scratch and try and duplicate. Well, after the Amiga, obviously it felt like the entire world just kind of moved over to the PlayStation, and, and obviously you were the same with Destruction Derby. Tell us a bit about Destruction Derby then, kind of the history of that, and um, how early did you have access to the PlayStation hardware? Uh, well, we were very lucky there in that uh, we had this um, solid relationship with, um, with Cygnosis, obviously from the, the Amiga days. And they were in the throes of this deal with Sony, which we, only, we knew about but didn't know too much about it. That, you know, Sony taking over uh, Cygnosis and the thinking being, you know, that Sony's going to launch this uh, console, they need a publishing partner or they need to own a publisher, they need some launch titles because, you know, Sony didn't have the, the gravitas that uh, Nintendo and Sega did at that time. So, to you know, to get people on board, they needed, I suppose, to, to own a, a publisher or a developer. Um, so we were already in there with them. I remember Ian Hetherington saying, right, everybody come up with some game ideas, game designs, uh, just on paper, basically. And uh, and I scribbled out. I mean, I'd always wanted to do a game with crashing cars, but it, it just was never possible to do it, uh, you know, to, to my satisfaction anyway, with anything other than perhaps some really high-end PCs. But, you know, that we weren't working on PCs at the time. But um, I, I designed this system of crushing polygons together and making them look like they were bent and buckled, but also crucially having the the, um, the textures, high resolution, high bit depth, photographic, photorealistic textures of smashed up cars um, using a very simplistic mesh. So not relying on the mesh buckling, but relying mainly on the textures. Um, and anyway, so I scribbled all this out in a document that was, you know, just four or five pages long. It was very, very short. And at the time, a lot of developers were sending these enormous documents, a very complicated game. And one of the advantages of, of ours was it was such a short document. People would pick it up and read it and it wouldn't take very long. And it was also, you know, quite compelling because it was smashing up cars and it was a very short document. And you could just sort of imagine in your own head how that might turn out if it was done well. And, um, and we had a little bit of a battle at the beginning, not with... Uh, not with the main uh, guys at uh, Cygnosis, but some of the product review guys thought it sounded far too similar to an arcade game, Daytona, by uh, by Sega. Mm. I, I just didn't get that at all. What it was was that you could damage your car in the Daytona arcade machine, if you remember. And it would sort of make the car wobble around and bent the, the, you know, bent the bonnet up a bit. Um, and you know what we were pro- pro- proposing was something far more well, the game was actually about that. You know, the whole point of the game was to turn around, head in the other direction, smash the cars to pieces, and it was not really a race at all. So it got a bit mis- misunderstood by some people. And um, and I just always re- remember being in a meeting where Ian, Ian Hetherington just stood up in this meeting and said, look, we are doing this game, whether you like it or not, we are doing it. And, uh, and I just thought, oh, right, brilliant, right, we've got Ian Hetherington on board here. <laughs> so, he's, you know, we're going to get it done. And then straight after that, within a day or two, I, you know, we had a, a development kit in our office and, uh, and you know, contractual stuff was starting to get moving. And, um, and we, we had actually, we, we got the, uh, the development kit in the office. And within a day, the lead programmer, Mike, again, Mike Troughton, had this, you know, polygon spinning on the screen. And within a week, a car spinning fully textured. So it was very, very rapid, actually, because that machine was quite sort of developer-friendly, unlike perhaps some of the later PlayStations, but certainly the first one was. So we got it up and running quite quickly. And, and within a week, we had this car on the screen that was driving around a track. It was all very makeshift, but it was driving around, and it really showed you visually how the game could look. And it was so fast up and running that the ball started moving very quickly because it wasn't just a document anymore it was actually something that you could could look at and then within a month of, of that um we built a, a 
demonstration of the collisions and it wasn't the game it wasn't you couldn't drive around but what you could do is you could position cars anywhere you wanted in a world and you could fire a car at them and it was the full damage model that you see in the final game all the physics all the, the destructive um, textures and, and whatnot bits flying off them and so on and because it was so flexible and you put cars anywhere you want, we produced this video that just said, this is what the crashes are going to look like. And it did for the time. It looked pretty amazing, really, because it was properly destructive and really quite satisfying. And I remember sitting up right through the night one day in the studio, setting up lots and lots of different collisions and picking the ones I thought were the best ones to, to show to them. And, uh, you know, and that went off to Cygnosis. And that's when everybody got on board because it was like watching a video of just, you know, cars being smashed to pieces. And then, uh, and then there was no more persuading needed. It was um, it, it was off, and we produced the game relatively quickly. Killed us, nearly mind. It took six months to produce that game, and uh, it's pretty much a seven days a week thing. Were you attending many um, destruction derbies or banger races, like for research? Yeah. So it was uh, when I was young, really young. Um, my dad used to take me and my brother to see real destruction derbies and real banger racing in the UK. Uh, and we used to go all over the country and watch these things. And I, that that was, you know, what I, I was, I guess, five or six or something. And I would jump over. When the Destruction Derby had ended, I'd jump over the railing and go and inspect all the damage on the cars. I had this really strange obsession with smashed-to-pieces cars and car chases in films and, and all of that. And uh, I used to just run around the cars and just have a look at them. So when it came to the research for this game, I went to the same the same racetracks uh, with a, the DSLR, DSLRs had just about come out then, and uh, photographing every single car that went out and the same car when it came back in. I went to uh, 40, 50, 60 real banger races all around the UK whilst, whilst the team were you know building the game. And what I was after was a progression of five textures from the front, five textures, textures from the back, five textures of a door, photographic that we didn't have to fiddle with that were one car gradually getting more and more smashed up and the car if you notice was at the old boxy ford granada for the simple reason that at that time that was the car of choice at real british banger races mm. um, for a few years so it needed to be the same car it needed to be consistent and needed to show that progression of damage so that's the car that was you know was actually used and um and eventually after watching 30, 40, 50 real banger races at different locations all around the country, I'd managed to get a progression of a Ford Granada in five stages of perfect uh, increasing uh, damage. And those were the textures that went on the cars. Amazing. Um, you know, actually, I remember the first time I saw Destruction Derby, that was on the um, the PlayStation Magazine demo discs, you know, the, the CDs that came yeah. on the front of the mags. I mean, how important were they to a game's success back then, would you say? They, they probably were. I'm not sure... Uh, how how important it was to Destruction Derby because Destruction Derby was basically a launch game or a UK PlayStation launch game and it had masses of attention anyway and we'd got a lot of front covers I mean uh, pretty much every PlayStation magazine at one stage had Destruction Derby on its front cover so there was a huge amount of press and uh, uh, visibility anyway for that game plus the fact that the only game you could buy the only games you could buy during that first launch week or few weeks was uh wipeout uh, ridge racer which was the japanese launch title toontown racing that then became that was polyphony that then became later the, the gran turismo series but they did a cartoony game first and um lemmings 3d i believe and then you know one or two others but very very few games so you know, if you were doing something that was different and quite sort of visually impressive and, and you know, smashing cars, who doesn't love smashing cars? Uh, it, it sort of sold itself almost. Yeah, and I think for the audience that the PlayStation was going for, like, you know, teenage boys, you couldn't get better than yeah. smashing up a car. Yeah, yeah, and it had tons of support from the, the publisher. Obviously, Cygnosis really pushed it. They had a, a high level of confidence in it. We'd have, you know, press days, and we'd have 20, 30 magazines from all around the world would come and see us in Newcastle, and we'd show them the game, and and, you know, you could just tell that everybody really liked it. So it just means that, that there's, a, there's a sort of a wave of anticipation and excitement coming anyway. So, you know, we, we knew it was going to be successful. It's just we had no idea quite how successful it was going to be. Because I remember we've spoke to like the Oliver Twins on this podcast before, and they told us a while back that they, you know, they saw that T-Rex demo 
you know, that everyone was um, showing on, on the PlayStation demo. And they tried to develop a game for it, but actually the industry reception they were getting was, you know, a lot of companies were holding off a bit. So you're like, you know, well, Sony's, a, it's, a, it's a hi-fi manufacturer. They don't know consoles. But obviously I imagine the fact that you're in there with Cygnosis, that must have instilled a lot more confidence, I imagine. Uh, yes, I think that's exactly it. I mean, Cygnosis, you know, they've been bought by Sony. So that was that, their entire job was to deliver games for this system. You know, and the budget was no longer coming from Cygnosis, really. The budget was coming from Sony, who produced the console. So, you know, it, everything lined up well. Um, and you can understand, uh, you know, the EAs of this world and, and many others going, well, eh, let's just see let's just see how this goes before we spend proper money on the development. Because the development budgets for these games, you know, had just taken a serious step up if you were going to compete at the level that the, that the system demanded to be visually um, competitive. So you can understand why there'd be a bit of trepidation, but we didn't suffer from that at all because of the lucky, lucky timing and the lucky position that we were in with respect to the publisher. Well, obviously by the time Destruction Derby 2 came along, that was, you know, a big improvement in technology and features as well. I mean, did that game kind of help develop Driver? No, um, there was no similarity at all, but uh, uh, Destruction Derby 2 was another example of wanting to expand the game at the expense of, of other things. So in many ways, there were things I prefer, I'm talking personally here, but there were things that I still preferred about Destruction Derby 1. I liked the fact that you could see every single car on the track um, at one at one time. You know, you didn't have 20 cars spread around a track that was 10 miles long. You could see everything mm. at the same time. And so the destruction tended to keep the cars quite bunched together. And that would be quite exciting because you get a lot of a lot of high-impact crashes and multiple cars, it would look like carnage, really. Um, but what we wanted to do with just Destruction Derby 2 is make the tracks more interesting, make them longer, make the racing more interesting, make it so that the cars could actually now flip, and, and a few things like that that really expanded the game. And, uh, and, and it did well. It did very, very well. It was reviewed well, and, um, you know, and I'm, I'm still pleased with what we, uh, what we did in terms of expanding the game and, and it, sometimes get these sort of... Um, lazy sequels i think we've all been guilty of those at some stage but you know that definitely wasn't a lazy sequel that was a huge amount of work we we scrapped almost everything there were very few shared lines of code bef- between destruction derby one and destruction derby two just because of the different scale of what we were trying to do with it well let's get into driver because obviously that was such a groundbreaking game tell us a bit about the development on that then and what were kind of the, the biggest challenges of doing that first game well the idea for driver came actually whilst um i was in the middle of the um playing the cross, the, the figure of eight cross um, over track in Destruction Derby. And uh, years and years ago, I'd, I'd planned to do a, a game where you were sort of like a, an undercover, uh, not an undercover cop, sorry, you'd be a, you were a cop responding to emergencies and stuff like that. Anyway, it was a seed of an idea. It never got used because you, you could only ever do top down. There was no, not particularly what I wanted to do, but I was playing with uh, the, the crossover track and I just remember pulling up at the crossover, at the crossroads, and thinking, wouldn't it be great if you could have, the, there were like traffic lights here, and instead of going straight ahead, you could choose to go right, which you could anyway in Destruction Derby, you could go right or left or straight on, but for it to be a proper working traffic system where the, the lights would change to red and everyone would stop and you could just do what you wanted, you could cause carnage or you could stop at the lights and you know turn left, turn right and all that. And that was the, the point at which I thought, right, Let's just play this like it's a real street system and pretend that's what it is. And, it, you know, and it, it was compelling just to mess about in that way with it. And uh, the idea, unfortunately, had to just sit there and wasn't used for, well, at least a year because Cygnosis had sort of demanded a sequel to Destruction Derby, which made perfect sense and, you know, didn't have any objections from me because we knew that, you know, it would be successful if we did a good job of it. So we just had to divert the resources into that and it just sort of sat on the back burner. And once later editions of Destruction Derby were coming out, they were nothing to do with us. So we didn't create the DD3 or arenas or anything like that. But we were free to, to develop something else. And that's when the development for Driver uh, kicked off. Initially on the PC, actually, because we weren't sure whether the, PlayStation, whether the PlayStation's hardware was going to be up for it. Because it, having an open street system, it demanded a lot of uh, both texture and geometry data and the only way that we thought that that could possibly work on the playstation would be to live stream it off the cd drive 
DVD drive, sorry. CD, was it CD or DVD? Yeah, I CD, it wasn't the PS1, yeah. It wasn't even a D- DVD. Yeah, so the amount of data that, w- that you, you couldn't store it all in memory is what I'm getting to, is it had to be streamed. And we just didn't know whether it would work. And the, in, the initial libraries and stuff that supported development on the PlayStation didn't allow that. And you weren't really allowed to tinker too much. Some of the da- Japanese developers, uh, Sony themselves, did. But we weren't really allowed to, even as Psygnosis. We, we were very limited in what we could do. But anyway, as time went on, they started to develop more of these um, the tools and the engine stuff that uh, allowed you a bit more tinkering and poking around. And, uh, and it took us a while to have the demonstration on the PlayStation that you could actually stream the data at a sufficient enough rate, uh, rate whilst you're playing the game, remember? It was no good stopping and downloading all the data. This was something that had to happen whilst you were playing without impacting performance too much. And also, remember that a game like Driver, if you decide you want to go left and not right, you're all of a sudden you're streaming different data. So you've got to pick up the head on the CD drive, send it somewhere else, start streaming that. Again, all of it had to be seamless you couldn't stop the game to do that and all this stuff had to be tested out we just had genuinely no idea if it was going to be possible or not anyway you know after months of messing about many many months of messing about and uh, and testing and and uh, doing uh, little demonstrations we, we managed to uh, get it working uh, well enough and uh, continue to optimize it and, and actually it worked really well you know you could drive in any direction as fast as you wanted you were never aware of any loading really so uh, so we then sw- uh, swapped the, the lead development from PC onto PlayStation and the PlayStation became the dominant um, platform because at that stage, it wasn't Psygnosis that was uh, publishing it. At that stage, I was developing it uh, myself and paying for it myself and, and planning to choose who would publish it at the end. And uh, very long story short there is that Psygnosis or Sony were going to publish it and then along came GT Interactive and uh, instead said they couldn't match the Sony's offer for publishing, but they could buy the company, and we went down that uh, that route in the end. But it was a, a PC game at the time because it wasn't a game directly for Sony at that, at that point. But we were very glad in the end it did lead on PlayStation for obvious reasons because by then the PlayStation was a massive install base and was the prominent platform. I know Driver's got like a notoriously tough start for a new player i mean was it a, a kind of conscious decision to make it for like hardcore gamers um i think it was more of a of an accidental thing that back in the day games used to be designed by the programmer or the artist there were no focus groups there was no even very little if any input from the publisher saying no change this change that or that's too hard people don't like that people would rather this you know and so on that you have in a modern uh, sensible development you have a lot of focus and attention on it to make sure that you've got playability right difficulty right and you know and so on so it was really down to us as a developer and ultimately down to me how hard that game was and i was a hardcore game player so unless it was brutally hard i thought it was too easy and we did make that garage thing far too hard i think in retrospect but I thought, well, I can do this garage sequence in 23 seconds. Therefore, if we give people 60 seconds, that's, that's I think, too much. And, uh, you know, clearly it wasn't, but it was far too hard. And also, you know, design decisions that you would never dream of today, like uh, you couldn't progress into the game itself, the game proper, until you'd completed that test, mm. you know, effectively, comp- properly finished it, completed it, ticked all the boxes, done it in under the time limit. You would never, ever design a game like that now. You would, you might have that test in there, but you would say, okay, you failed it five times now or whatever. Would you like to just proceed without having, you know, that would be the sensible way to do things. But th- that's the way games were designed back then, or certainly by us and many of my uh, friends at the time was just you know it was up to you how hard you want to make it and i wanted to make it hard i didn't like easy games well driver 2 you know really felt like it was pushing the limits of the playstation 1 you know the hardware was kind of creaking under that game you were pushing it so hard i mean was it a challenge to make that game with less time and obviously had options like you know getting out of the car and stuff like that as well yeah it um it was pushing the hardware uh i mean play, you know driver 1 was pushing the hardware hard but actually you know, with with later developments and optimization, we we could have had even more out of Driver One if we if we'd had more time and uh, and more you know more time for optimization and, and rewriting bits and bobs in in newer uh, ways and so on. But Driver Two was probably chewing well was definitely uh, biting off more than it could chew with that CD system for the 
uh, streaming because what, some of the key things that I wanted to change and improve for Driver 2 were more cars, more variety of cars, you know, school buses and uh, and vans and trucks and cars and everything. Whereas the cars in Driver 1, there were just two cars and that was it, two designs and that was it. And also for the for the the cities to be not just American cities that are a crisscross of blocks and, and streets, you know, with their 90 degree bends, but to have proper curving tracks and up into the hills and what have you. And to do all of that, the amount of geometry and car data that had to be pulled off the drive was massively higher than, dri- than driver one. Mm. And we never really quite nailed that. We just ran out of time. So the game was um, could be stuttery at times. It, it wouldn't run as smoothly as driver one. I do regret not having had a little bit more time. And it was only probably a bit more time just to optimize all that. But at the end of the day, you know, you, you run out of time. But all the stuff to do with getting out the car and the, the changing cars and, you know, um, that was all. That all worked really well, and I was I was pleased with the game in the end, and the story was much better, and the cutscenes were, were better, and the music was better, and the, the the missions were more varied because of the added flexibility, and also the different cityscapes instead of just being U.S. cities. So um, that was all good, and it was a huge amount of work, and it nearly again it was another game that nearly killed us in times in terms of the amount of hours and effort that went into it. But um, with the exception of that stuttering that it suffered because of not being able to draw enough off the drive. I think everything else we were very pleased with in that game. Did you ever get frustrated with the constant comparisons with Grand Theft Auto? Because, I mean, obviously they're very much separate games, but did you kind of feel like the media was creating a bit of a, a tech arms race between the franchises at the time? Um, yeah, probably they were. I mean, you, you, I remember reading the, the stuff. Um, but the, the, at the time, they weren't really comparable because Driver was, well, Driver was on PlayStation 1. I mean. Uh, Grand Theft Auto was uh, PlayStation 2, wasn't it? Um, yeah, GTA 3, yeah. GTA 3, yeah. So, oh, yeah, there were GTAs before the top-down view that Dave Jones and the, the DMA guys uh, did. But that was, you know, you couldn't compare that to Driver. But that was a top-down, you know, stealing cars, I guess, and doing all those sort of baddie missions and stuff. Um, but GTA, the one that most people think about GTA was the Liberty City uh, GTA 3 or GTA 3D, but that was PlayStation 2. So, um it, that came out after Driver 2. So Driver 2 was the first to have the getting out of the car, but we didn't do anything re- with it, really, apart from ch- changing cars. We just wanted a realistic way of swapping between cars. That was it. Uh, there were some missions where you'd flick a switch or whatever, but we didn't we didn't use it very much. You certainly didn't have a gun or anything like that. It was all just pretty simplistic stuff. Um, GTA was less about the car. When it, when it came out, GTA 3 was less about car chases and more about the missions out the foot and shooting and, and all the stuff that GTA is famous for. So they were very different at the time. I mean, things converged later on when we did more out of car stuff and they did more focus on the cars as well. So they, they converged in that way, but not at that stage, you know, driver two came out. I don't remember how long before grand theft auto, but it was on a, you know, previous generation machine. So it must've been a year or two. And then GTA took that getting out of cars and missions far, far further than driver and did it uh, obviously very successfully. It was an amazing game, but amazing for different reasons. I know Driver 3 had a bit of a troubled development cycle from what I've heard about it. I mean, what was kind of what happened there from your perspective then with Driver 3? Um, it, it, Driver 3 was, that was um, moving on to a new system, new, uh, the, the, you know, the uh, newer PlayStation. Um, the issue there was just really biting off more than we could chew and doing, I think, too much of the um, the out-of-car stuff that we didn't really have much experience with, uh, well, didn't have any experience with apart from what we'd learned during Driver 2. And by then, Grand Theft Auto had been out and others where you're sort of running around open streets and uh, and stuff and had been quite well developed. And we were coming at it from the, fir- for the, from the, you know, the first game. And I was, I was very happy actually with all the uh, with all the car stuff. So all the, the stuff that you did in the car, the car chases, the dynamics, and the smashing them up, and the missions involving cars. But we just really just didn't get the out of car stuff finished. And there was a lot of pressure from the the publisher as well in terms of uh, you know their well documented uh, financial difficulties. And the game had to come out had to come out no matter what. Absolutely no option. This is the date, and we just we just couldn't get it finished to the. Well, I should say we couldn't get the out of car stuff finished to the the point that we wanted it to be finished. So it was quite buggy, and um, and the AI was just not well not well rounded, not well formed, 
um, a lot of scripted stuff going on with the characters out of the out of the car. And if, if you'd been used to something like Grand Theft Auto, you know, where they've spent a lot of time on that and it looked and it all sort of was was well, you know, well known and well played, uh, it was really quite uh, simplistic. And we shouldn't have. It was my fault for wanting it to have everything. And the thing is, you need a lot of time and a lot of people for that. And you also can't be saying this game comes out on this date, no matter what. So I was a bit of a, a victim of a number of uh, different things, but basically me pushing too hard, as is, you know, happened various times in games we've been developing, just wanting more and more and more to the point where actually it would have been better with a bit less, less, less. I guess the difference then was, you know, now you just push some updates down, wouldn't you, over Xbox Live or PSN. When you had it pressed on a PS2 disc or an original Xbox, wasn't quite as simple for most people, I imagine, to do patches. No, it wasn't. No, well, I, I don't remember even if you could do patches mm. at all then. I mean, you could do a patch in terms of a new run, the CD or the DVD, but that's not the same, is it? Because mm. um, people already have the, the game in their hands. Uh, unfortunately, when you have a, a deadline that you have no choice about, you then can't... I've, I've had people say to me, well, why didn't you just pull out a load of missions? And the thing is, you can't actually do that because by doing that, you've then wrecked the what's going on in the story and things don't make sense anymore. So you're sort of a bit stuck. You've made your decisions. You've decided you're going to push the envelope in these different directions. And that's it. You've just got to live with it. And unfortunately, we just ran out of time. I think we would have got there, but we would have got there. It would have taken a lot longer than any of us uh, really uh, envisaged. You know, the, the out-of-car stuff, is is just very very it's very difficult to to get it well and, and working properly and uh, and we just run out of time well driver i mean it's still got you know fans all over the world and it's been quite a while since we last had an installment in the series i mean would you like to see it come back in some form um yes i would i mean we did the last one that we did was uh, driver san francisco and uh, and we were very uh, very pleased with that i mean that was uh, that was another one which was pushing the limits of the hardware to uh, to the absolute limit, um, and that was that was a great experience working with Ubisoft because they were very much about quality, quality, quality. Um, the deadline didn't matter as much; uh, it was about quality. And they made a decision. Just one simple example of this was they just suddenly mandated that, yeah, we think this is all great, the zooming in and out of the cars and the city and everything, but we want it to run in sixty frames a second. And we, I remember sitting with the programs, just thinking, oh my. God, you know, this is doing a lot as it is. How are we going to hit 60 with something that's going to do this? And you can zoom right up to the top of the city and look down on it like Google Maps and and um, just instantaneously zap into these other cars and suddenly be in them. And they've got a new dashboard. They've got all the audio and, and the cars, uh, you know, a totally different car. And there's, there's hundreds of cars in the game. And how's this all going to go? Into? Anyway, the long story short was that it basically added a year, if not two years, to the entirety of that development just to optimize, rewrite, optimize, rewrite, rewrite to get that game running in 60 frames a second. And, uh, you know, lots of people appreciate that, but I'm, I bet there's a good few that wouldn't have cared whether it was in 60 or 30. But but Ubisoft did, you know, and that's what they wanted. They wanted it in 60 frames a second. And I was always a sucker for frame rates. I loved 60 frames a second just from back in the old arcade games where all arcade games ran in 60 frames a second. And um, get used to it. It's a you know it's it's a luxury, but uh, it really made a huge difference. So you know we we pushed and pushed and pushed, but we had all the time in the world that we wanted to do that, and uh, the resources in terms of uh, you know the quality of the staff, the number of the staff in the team, where, who who we could pull on from external studios for help with this and that. It, it just was a whole different ball game to uh, the GT um, interactive experience, where the you know, they're, they're a company in difficulty. So uh, th- that was a great experience. So we were very pleased with uh, what we what we ended up putting out with that game. Well, Martin, I know you're on holiday and you've got um, family engagements this afternoon, so we won't keep you too much longer, but it's been incredible reminiscing with you and really appreciate you taking the time talking to us. I mean, can you tell us what you're working on these days, then? Is there anything we should keep an eye on coming up? I'm wor- no, I'm working on my uh, on my holiday at the minute. Yeah. <laughs> <There's> n- <laughs> n- nothing, nothing to report yet, no. Well, Martin, thanks so much for coming on and uh, being our guest and enjoy the rest of your holiday. All right. Well, thank you very much. All right. Cheerio. Bye-bye. <laughs>